Jones is hurt. My name is Evan Firebstein, with me is Eric Johnson, and we are here to talk about hockey. How long have you been playing hockey? I've been playing since I was about five years old, so that would make this, uh, I think, my 18th year. Wow. It's been a while. It's a lot of hockey. Do you feel qualified to share your knowledge of hockey with the... Jenner? With Miss Lundstrauss class? Miss Lundstrauss class. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and thank you very much for having me on. It's, it's been a pleasure to be <coughs> skating around here with you guys for the last hour or so. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how the introduction of carbon composite hockey sticks has changed the game of hockey. Obviously these are a lot better than the wooden sticks that you used to see in the 50s and earlier before they... And actually all the, all the way through the 80s. That's actually a great question. So what's happened in the last uh, 20 years or so, 20, 30 years, is there's been this introduction of this really lightweight carbon composite material. So they first started weaving plastic composites with uh, Kevlar, they went to aluminum for a little while, found that that didn't work out. And then as they really advanced the materials technology, they went with this woven, uh, it's a carbon fiber really is what it is. Um, and it, what it allows you to do is get a really, really light stick that still retains a lot of flex. So you'll see in different slow-mo shots that you've taken, it provides a lot of power to the puck. So uh, two things that they've changed, the big rule changes in the NHL, have been they've limited the size of the curve, which reduced the shot speed. But at the same time, they went to these new sticks, which really allowed the players to increase their shot speed due to the, the increased uh, torque that you could provide the shot and all the, the stored energy in the stick that's transferred to the puck during the shot. So um, it's been a huge change. It's allowed players in the NHL skills competition now to shoot well over 100 miles an hour with their slap shots, which is uh, very, very impressive to get a puck that weighs about a pound and a half moving that quick. There's a lot of force behind it. So you're talking about the flex for the stick. Are there different flexes or are all the sticks the same flex? Uh, yeah, there are quite a few actually. So um, in the NHL, you'll see players who range from about 170 pounds to 250 pounds, depending on the positions they play. And they'll all want different amounts of flex on their stick. So the heavier players will want a stiffer stick because otherwise they'll snap them. And with the stiffer stick, they can still get a lot of torque because they put a lot of weight into their shots. Uh, lighter players who tend to shoot more wrist shots will get uh, more flexible sticks. This is what's called an 85 flex. It's probably on the lower end of the spectrum. So it's rather loose, but what it allows you to do is you don't have to get all your body weight into the shot in order to get the stick to flex a lot. Uh, at the same time, it's probably a little more prone to breaking than some of the stiffer sticks. Dude! <laughs> so it really becomes a personal preference and a body size um, issue for the player. And then you're talking about the curve of the stick. How does the curve of the stick affect you when you're shooting with it? Yeah, so the, the curve, uh, there are rule limits in the NHL, but basically um, the steeper the curve is, or the more pronounced the curve from the heel, which is the blade, or the, the bottom end of the blade, to the toe, which is the farthest out from the shaft of the stick, is going to influence um, a couple different things, mostly how much accuracy control you have, and also it's going to have a big effect on the amount of control you have on your backhand. So if you get a flatter curve, you'll have a, a better backhand, a stronger backhand, but the flip side of that is that your wrist shots probably won't be able to get as much speed on them because the puck won't be able to travel as uh, pronounced a path along the blade of the stick in order to get some of that speed built up. So this, uh, this curve right here, each uh, manufacturer, each company has its own players that they sponsor so they can uh, put out different players' own blade patterns that you can buy as, as just a, an average hockey player, everyday hockey player. So this is a Datsuk curve. Um, it tends to fall in the middle of the range in terms of the amount of curve that goes from the heel to the toe. Uh, players who tend to play with more flat curves would be players like Sidney Crosby. Um, Steven Stamkos of the Tampa Bay Lightning would have a much steeper curve and he's well known for his wrist shot. Uh, some players actually try and push the limit and have been caught for having illegal curves. Um, Alexander Semin and Tamu Solani are, are some notable recent examples of players who have tried to really uh, gain an unfair advantage by bending their sticks a little too much. So one thing I've noticed from personal experience playing hockey is that when I, when I shoot one-timers, it seems to be faster than any other kind of shot that, in my arsenal. Mm -hmm. So can you explain why that is? Yeah, so a one-timer is basically when uh, another a teammate of yours passes you the puck and you take a slap shot by striding into the puck. So uh, two things are at play here. One, anytime you take a slap shot, what you're going to want to do 
is hit about six inches or so behind the puck. So you can really get that stick to flex off whatever surface you're playing on. And then it's going to snap back into the puck and propel it towards the net. What happens with a one-timer, all the pucks that you play with, whether you're indoors, on ice, or out here playing roller hockey, They're made of some sort of rubber, so they have certain elastic properties. So what uh, the one-timer allows you to do is the puck's own momentum is going to carry it into your stick as well, and it's going to compress the puck uh, along with the uh, action of your stick. So the elasticity of the puck is really helping you off the rebound. So not only is your stick launching the puck towards the net, but the puck is literally bouncing off your stick as it rebounds and, and decompresses basically from the speed of that pass. So the harder the pass, the quicker the puck's coming at your stick, and the more it's going to compress when it first hits your stick, which means that as it leaves, it's going to snap back even harder. So really, uh, your, your teammates can help you out a lot with the one-timer. Out here, this is a roller surface. Mm -hmm. How is skating and turning and stopping on this surface different from stopping on <laughs> indoors or ice? Yeah, so there are a couple of key differences. The biggest one, if you look at the skates, obviously when you're playing on ice hockey, you have a metal blade that has two edges, one on either side of the blade surface. And out here, you don't have edges. You just have the rubber on the wheels. So um, the constants between the two are that Anytime you're skating forwards, the force of you going forwards is, is never um, in the same direction as the blade of your skate, or your wheels in this case, but it's really at the normal, or 90 degrees from the wheel. So you want to, in both cases, try and turn your skates so that they're facing as far behind you with the four wheels um, kind of perpendicular to your direction of travel, so you can get as much forward momentum out of it as you can. Um, the differences mainly involve stopping. So out here, when you're playing on wheels, uh, what you really want to do to stop is create a lot of friction with the wheels. So you're actually having the wheels slide along the floor and the friction between the floor and the wheels is what's stopping you. Indoors on ice, it's the biting of the edge into the ice. So there's not as much sliding. So you actually have a lot more control when you're playing indoors than when you do out here because you don't have to worry as much about uh, losing grip between the wheels and the surface. It's more as long as your legs are strong enough to hold up your edges, your edges will bite in um, probably more strongly than your edges will give out uh, much farther down the road than your legs will give out. Your legs will give out first, so uh, a lot more control on the ice, that's for sure. So if I'm skating right now and I'm trying to travel in the direction of my stick, in other words, forward this way, and I just tilt my skate like this and push off, all the work that's being done is carrying me this way. So I'll have to counteract that on the next stride with this skate, and what you'll get is kind of a zigzag pattern along the rink, which is really inefficient if you're trying to move quickly down the rink that way. So what you're trying to do, and this is where a lot of the flexibility in hockey players comes in handy, is you're trying to bend your leg as much as possible to be pointed straight behind you so that the entire force vector that's created really is directed down the, the ice, or in this case, the concrete in front of you. So this motion, trying to skate, is inefficient and pushing me to the side. If I can really twist my skate and my legs, this motion is going to get me down the rink as fast as possible. So we talked about skating, we talked about shooting, mm -hmm. let's talk about what a lot of people are interested in is the physical aspect of the game, the hitting and the checking and the roughing in the boards. Mm -hmm. Would you say from personal experience, does it hurt more to get hit into the boards or to get hit open ice? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, the boards on a hockey rink, they're designed with a lot of give. So probably the, the best analogy I could come up with for that is um, they're very similar. If you've ever seen those, those toys on uh, physics teacher's desk where they have the five steel balls that are suspended, and you pull back one, and when you let it hit the other four, only the ball at the far end keeps going again, and it just continues like that. But the ones in the middle stay the same. Uh, same principle, where the energy of, of a uh, collision is transferred to the last object that's... That hurt. Touched. So in this case, when you're hitting to the boards and they have a lot of give, the energy of the impact is going to go through you and into the board. So it's going to be unpleasant for you, but compared to an open ice hit, probably not as um, not as significant. You won't feel it nearly as much, I would imagine. So I would say that open ice hits are, are far worse. And if you look at, if you browse YouTube, as I'm sure you have, no, I have, for huge hockey hits, they're everywhere. Most of the biggest ones happen to be those open ice hits. Um, hitting to the boards, if, as long as a player can see it coming, they'll generally bounce back from it okay. But a big open ice hit can be pretty devastating. Um, in this latest uh, NHL playoffs, Ryan Close suffered a separated shoulder from an open ice hit, wherein he uh, took a, a pretty large hit from a Detroit defenseman. And if you look at the course of that series, he actually took quite a few big hits into the boards, but they didn't have nearly the same effect as that single open ice hit. The one thing that the boards do 
hurt more is when you see the people go in head first, which oh, has absolutely. been happening a lot more lately with the concussions. Um, what do you have to say about that and how the NHL is cracking down on hits to the head? I think it's the right thing. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the league is based around having skilled players in, and you only have a limited supply of these super elite NHL caliber players. And when they're getting hurt, it just hurts the game for everyone. So um, players are able, to, they know the difference between a dirty hit and a clean hit, and they're able to hold up if they need to. The one thing that I don't like, though, is when elite players see someone coming and then turn their back. And then um, the hitting player is the one that's punished when, in reality, players should also know to defend themselves. They shouldn't expose themselves like that. So there are two sides to that coin, but in general, the blind side behind uh, their hits to, from behind, I think the NHL really needs to get rid of and suspend and find players more for. All right. Thank you, Eric. That's all the time we have for today. But thank you for coming out and showing us how to play the wonderful game of hockey. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.